Hello? Yes, hi. Good afternoon from here. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? I'm very good. How, about How is you? everything? It's been a while. It has been a while because you have been outside and I've been inside. You know? This conversation has generated a lot of issues on on social media, especially on Twitter. Okay. Um, because apparently there was some assumption that I was supposed to be the one speaking on political activism. Or maybe it was just intentional misconception. But I'm glad to host you on behalf of EIE. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask, like, do we have the critical mass to actually, because from you being the person right there at the forefront of this activism and trying to get Nigerians to be involved, do we have the critical mass to make a move in a way that the political system will pay attention? and listen to the Nigerian people from the point of activism? Yes. Do you think we do? We do. Uh, OK. But the question is, what is critical mass? Critical mass are, you know, about critical mass is the mass of people who understand deeply enough and are committed enough to change an oppressive political system. We have them. The question is, have they actually moved to the barricades? Have they moved to the front lines? And are they courageous enough to uh, confront the system to the point that they can cripple the system and give themselves uh, the British space and liberty and freedom they need to have integrity as citizens. That is the question that uh, is always dangling on the ceiling. So in but that, we so, do. Okay, so we in do that case, does it then look like we have a challenge with mobilization if we have the uh, number? I, you know, I don't, I won't say we have a challenge with mobilization. The question is, that when we mobilize, how many people are mobilizing and how many people are demobilizing? That's the question. And, you know, when we come to an agreement, a concrete agreement that things are bad, why are people still dilly-dallying or debating or analyzing or, you know, overanalyzing what we should do next? That's the problem. You know, you know the controversy that you're talking about on Twitter, right? Some people consider you an activist, right? Mm. Because, you know, whether you like it or not, you came, you know, as an activist to the public uh, domain. And when things happen, they look up to you because people follow you. You have thousands of followers, right? They expect to hear from you very clearly what is wrong and what should be done about it. The same thing applies to me. The same thing applies to the EIA guys. It applies to the people who call themselves, uh, you know, social media influencers today. They are actually, yeah, but... you know, uh, persons who are living up of public trust. And that's why you see there's controversy when people don't get clarity from us. When they think that we are playing games with their intelligence, they come after us. They ask hard questions. It's not as if the people that are asking you questions on Twitter are not all necessarily sponsored people. They're actually the critical mass that we are. What they, what they want from us. Because we always uh, talk about, you know, what, you know, what. Country. Okay, so the question is, we, you hear me? so you spoke to EIE. Yeah, 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 I was losing you for a bit, but I got the most part of what you Can said. Can you hear me? Yes, but I was losing it for a bit, but I got the most part of what you said. So where do we draw the balance between organizations that attract resources from outside of the country, from yes. taxpayers that are not Nigerians, yes. and the interests of those organizations, and the interests of their foreign, their foreign funders, and the Nigerian interests? Where do we find the intersection for the, the interests of the Nigerian people in particular? Because I, for instance, I don't have any organization sending me money to do this or do that. I'm, I'm, I'm a private citizen. Yes, I have a lot of followers. The same thing with a lot of Nigerians. But people like yourself also depend on people that fund, like Sahara Reporters, for instance, has resources from outside. EIE has, they have people that they are responsible to, that are ac accountable to. So, so how do you draw that line between fighting for a people and getting resources from outside of the country to supposedly fight for those people? You, say, you, make, you just make this general assumption that people get resources from outside. There's nothing called resources from outside. The resources that come from outside to fund public goods, they actually come from here. 
this is Africa. We are on the continent of Africa. Where no, but we have foreign to... organizations like Ford Foundation, Omedia yeah. Fund, CSOs mm -hmm. in Nigeria. Yes, that's correct. But what I'm telling you is that where do they make their money from? They make their money from trading things that come from the continent of Africa as well. So they're giving back. But if you want to go even that route with me, you know, I would challenge your university education if you went to a Nigerian university where Ford Foundation probably funded, you know, some of your lecturers. They funded some of the books you're reading. They sent you computers. So don't let us degrade the importance of, you know, the work we are doing in the public with this idea of, uh, you know, what I, what I would call a esoteric system of, uh, you know, somebody saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm the one who is funding myself. The money that you are, you are getting, do you know where it comes from? Have you traced it to, if you work for a state governor, for example, do you know where he got his grant from that he paid you from? Do you know whether they got a loan from an international organization or international, uh, you know, So the question entities? is, where do you yeah. draw the line between the different interests that are aligned to sponsor the different people that are sponsors? Where do we draw the line for the interests of the people because, in particular? Because there's, there's public conscience, right? There's good and there is bad, you know? The people who are getting money from the so-called independent people who are getting money from Nigeria, making money independently, a lot of them are bad, right? In fact, some of the monies that they steal from here, they send it abroad, and some of the foundations they are talking about help you repatriate it back to you so that you can use it for school, you can use it for water, you can use it for other things that you need in your own countries. What I'm saying is don't reduce this conversation to people who are getting money from abroad as if it's a crime. I'm not, I'm not really. reducing the conversation. No, what I'm, what I'm trying to, to... Let me finish. Let me finish. What I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that I, for example, I founded Sahara Reporters. It took me almost five years before I got any form of funding, right? The guys who started Yahoo got a fund from some guy. Some guy gave them a part. By the time they got a check from, I think, Paul Allen or something, I don't want to be quoted because I'm not sure as I'm speaking with you, but Whoever was the investor, they didn't have a bank account, right? So people who are creative, who create organizations or create uh, not-for-profit organizations and label them and register them as such, they have a purpose for it. And if they attract funding, because our local business people or local people are not interested in funding them, they want to be independent. Whenever you want funding from home, they want to control what you do. They want to tell you what to do. That is the reason why, for example, Sahara Reporters doesn't collect ads from government because the moment you take ads from them, the next day they are back to tell you what to write. We don't do that, you know. It's that you have to define what are your goals and what you do, what are the do's and what, you, and what are the don'ts. It's not about the foreign interest as we make it sound, like, oh, foreign interest. If foreign interest is a problem, then we should also abolish our democracy because it came from abroad, you know. A lot of the pro-democracy activities in this country was funded by organizations abroad in Finland, in, you know, in Denmark, in Germany, in the U.S. Because you have said you want democracy, which is not you know, uh, a particular uh, process that was you know, uh, created in, on the continent of Africa. But I'm not saying that democracy is alien to Africa. Let's be very, very clear about that. So in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis and the fact that Nigeria has been on a lockdown and most of the poor people in Nigeria, they end their living daily. So basically, they, they are in a position where government is saying, if you go outside, you're going to die. But they are in a position where they are going to also die of hunger if they don't go out. What's the place of activism in ensuring that people are safe? I want to correct you. I want to correct you. Nigeria was never in a lockdown. Nigeria it was put in a lock jam. Those are two different things. If Nigeria was in a lockdown, members of the presidency, you know, that is high officials of the presidency, including ministers, the secretary to the government of the federation would not have gone to a public barrier and behaved as if they are above the law. Right? Nigeria was never put in a lockdown. Okay, so let me jam. so let me say, let me let me use your word and say in the reality of Nigeria's lock jam. And yes. the fact that poor people cannot assess their means of livelihood. Now What's the place talking. of activism? Pardon me? I said, now you are talking. So, uh, using your words now. So, what's the place of activism in ensuring that these people that don't have access to their means of livelihood 
are able to continue to exist is, and thrive. This is, this is a time to know the real activists because it is in a time of sorrow, suffering, uh, blood and tears, if I want to borrow fellas' uh, terminologies, that you know those who are passionate, those who are compassionate. And compassion is not, you know, giveaways uh, alone because we have seen that giveaways cannot even last uh, very long. Nobody is doing it anymore as uh, it used to be at the beginning. Because in the first place, it is the duty of government, you know, I mean, real government, to protect citizens, to make sure that they provide for them in the period of difficulties. And I don't want to go to making examples about, uh, you know, the U.S. or Europe or anything too far. South Africa here, they make provision for all their citizens. They are paying people who have kids, who their parents, I mean, who kids don't, I mean, who, who, who are like baby mamas, as we call them. I don't like to use that derogatory technology, but I mean, a terminology, but this is something that is uh, generally used. They're supporting everybody across the board. You know, they're even supporting non-citizens. Even Italy, that had one of the worst cases of uh, corona uh, pandemic, supporting, you saw some Nigerians making videos when they go and collect their checks or cash from, uh, from the government. Here, you put people down in a lockdown, not the lockdown, or you imprison them, and then you send the police after them. You send the army after them. At the end of the day, as you are counting corona casualties, you are also counting the number of people killed by soldiers, police, civil defense. That is when you need real activists. That is where you know who is an activist. So what can we do to, to, to bring that issue to the fore and make sure that people are able to assess a form of living in that logjam? Yes. It's to ensure that we free up our resources and give it to the people that they belong to. We must force our government, you know. I don't use the word our government. Their government, the guys who are holding Nigeria to ransom today, to release resources to the vulnerable, the poor, and the weak, you know, and not make this period a period for the strong, the rich, and the powerful and connected. What am I trying to tell you? The Central Bank of Nigeria has already released about 200 billion naira to businesses, another 50 billion naira to people they call small businesses. We don't know who they are, but they have not given the generality of our population, the Nigerian people, you know, any support that is traceable. They just came out one day or a few days, put a bunch of uh, dirty naira notes on the table and claimed that they were distributing it. When people shouted, they fired the people who they said did it. And they said, well, if you look into your account and you have less than 5,000 Naira will give you some palliatives. I have 1,480 Naira. I've not gotten the palliative. I did not check in my account too. What I'm telling you is that there is no structure to the madness. There is no method to the madness of leadership in this country. And that is why we need real activists, people who can stand up, take the risk that is needed, and fight to ensure that the people don't die of hunger uh, at the point that they are in, in a logjam uh, accentuated by a leadership that I think is completely incompetent and confused. You know, and I'm saying it categorically, you know, this is the reason I went to uh, detention for five months. So you could have been Nigeria's president now because you ran for office. So I'd ask a question that has to do with the possibility that you could have won the elections. You probably would say you won the elections in, on May. There was no um, election, um, there were no elections. Those, those were selections, you know, and you can quote me any day, anywhere. So what, uh, if there was, what if there was an election? I would have won the and election won the if people like you supported me, by the way. What do you think, you know, Buhari? Media and like you. <laughs> yes. I'm going, to come to, I'm going to come to that aspect, by no the problem. way. No yeah. problem. Yes. What do you think? So I'm going to ask the question in two ways, but it's going to require the same answer. What do you think Buhari should be doing that he's not doing? Or what would you have been doing differently if you were president in a situation like this? You see, when we were campaigning, I wish we paid attention. We had a program uh, or a set of programs known as Spicer Heat. You know, that was our manifesto, which is that security will be our priority, power, infrastructure, anti-corruption, and we have an, a robust economic system, not the World Bank uh, style failed economic system that they keep uh, uh, revolving in Nigeria. And we had a program on health. Our program on health in particular was to have hired over 600,000 nurses across Nigeria. 
as soon as we came into office. That would have been May last year, right? And by the time this pandemic came, it wouldn't have met us, <laughs> you know, it wouldn't have caught us napping the way because we'd have had people set up across Nigeria to take care of this kind of problem. We would have invested a certain percentage of our national budget on healthcare, on education, on infrastructure, on security, and we would have nipped corruption in the board. And we would have diversified the economy. You know, people used to make fun of me, right? When I said, just one example of how to diversify the economy, which was that we could start growing medical marijuana in Undo State, Undo State and the Delta States, and be making billions by now, because Nigeria, you know, uh, incinerates over 15 trillion naira of marijuana every year. You were making fun of me. Go and check. Just Google it. How much that industry is worth now? And the oil that all of them were running around with has dropped to zero. You know, it's not. It's not about the fact that we knew what we were going to do, but we also were clairvoyant enough to know that you needed the kind of leadership that would put Nigeria on a strong footing, so that. If we find ourselves in a situation that we have found ourselves now, we will not be complaining. Because even the lackluster, in my view, uh, South African leadership did a better job. Our neighbors in Ghana did a better job. That's why they are able to now start reopening their economies while we are thinking about another two weeks or one month. I think our guys here are very happy that there's no nothing going on because they are just withdrawing cash and you know taking care of themselves anyways. So... But the kind of leadership that Nigeria needed, you know, it was as if we were prophetic in saying that, look, you can't continue like this because otherwise uh, you find yourself uh, in dire situations and we are in deep duty right now. Okay, so I asked a question. You said if I was paying attention, I thought that was disrespectful, but that's a different thing entirely. I'd like to go back to the election now. Are, are you able to unite a country as an activist and a politician, when people that are supposed to be like fellow activists, I don't know if you would agree that they are activists or not, you guys could not come together to agree on a consensus candidate. You know, not, I don't want to sound, I don't want to sound as if I'm bragging. I went to that meeting where they were talking about consensus candidate for the youth, only once. And I came to the conclusion that we are different. And I wasn't being arrogant. I didn't see the passion, the zeal, and the preparation amongst all these other young people that I met with that showed that they were ready for even leadership. And then a little bit of investigation showed that a lot of them were representing different special interests in the country. So it would be wrong to call some of them activists. Yes, a lot of them were motivational speakers. Uh, some of them were, you know, uh, all these half-baked economists uh, who keep repeating the same mantra on a daily basis. Some of that ones, you know, were actually, in my view, religious uh, uh, leaders. You know, they were very good pastors, some of, them, some of them. And don't forget that I went to more than one meeting. I also attended a meeting uh, in a VI uh, with where uh, I think uh, Chief uh, Kolade was in attendance. It was the same thing. I called aside one of the organizers. I said to them, look, most of these guys that you are trying to, you know, bring together, they are working at variance. And we stopped at that point and went down to the Nigerian people. Nobody campaigned more than I did. I went to 34 states, including the federal capital territory. Across Nigeria, we drove, we flew, we went on water. Everywhere you could go to, we went to the people. We campaigned, we had a manifesto, we had an agenda. We sold it to the Nigerian people. But the people you are referring to were more interested of more of the same. They wanted the same old people. They Do were you... accusing me of having no experience. And I asked them, the people you are, you are claiming have experience, what experience do they have apart from stealing? Nobody could answer it. Do, you, do you think that you probably have issues with their ideology rather than the fact that maybe they didn't they, they it collect all the It was not an ideological matter. It wasn't an ideological matter. I don't want us to you know, make it difficult because when you start talking ideology, you alienate some people. Clearly, I know how people feel about when you start, you know, talking about ideologies, like talking calculus. What yeah, I'm because saying I think is it's easy. I think you could tell easy. that they weren't they weren't representing the interests of the people. They weren't interested in campaigning. They just wanted to help. Not one of them. Not one of them. 
not, you know, the only person I would say, and I'll say publicly, that I thought was fairly, fairly uh, interested and different a bit was uh, Tokwe Fashua. But in all fairness to Tokwe, Tokwe wasn't interested to do a rugged fight, you know. He said, look, you know, I know what to say, I know what to do, but I don't want to fight these people. I'm just going to run. And he didn't stress himself too much, but I would be fair to him that I saw that Tokwe had, you know, fresh ideas and he was preaching them. And it wasn't diff difficult to find out after the elections were over, why did, where did all of them disappear to? As if the problems had gone away. So we confronted the problems because we knew that the situation would not improve and things would get worse. And you saw what they did to, uh, to someone like me. So where do we, so how do we then come to the table? Because something is common with the political class. We have elections in about three years and they're already coming together, having conversations. They know how to decide. They are not having, there's no political class having no conversations. They are just ganging up against Nigerian people. Okay, they are ganging they are, up. They are, Using your they word are now. Doing, they, they are, are doing ganging contracts. up. When, they are when are, are those that... They when don't are have those that... I know these people very well. None of them can sit down like you and I are speaking now. Mm -hmm. You know, you cannot have a conversation with President Buhari for as long as I have spoken with you. So when are you, when are you and those that care about Nigeria are going to have their own gang up, which is because now it looks like it's you're the working people. by yourself. The people these that are bad people. Are the people. These are bad people. Is the people you, when you want to when you want to liberate your country, you look right. You look out for the people who are suffering. You look out for the people who want change. You can't be running to the same people who created the problem, hoping to get a solution from them. Is the reason why. It is defined as a campaign that you go out there, sell your ideas, sell your manifestos, and get the people to vote. But the problem is that they at least don't allow elections to happen. I recorded it in my village. They brought soldiers, nothing less than 12 of them. I was using a small drone. They shut it down. This was, this was I put it out on social media. They didn't allow people to vote. They took the election materials away from the polling units to the collection centers. So they were just manufacturing figures. It was the reason why they were so scared of going to court that they had to manipulate the, uh, the court system to remove anybody that they thought could be an obstacle. All of us saw all this. What we need is to come to that point of truthfulness about our problems and how to solve it and not to be cowardly about it. You know? Not okay, to be so we have, reached the, we have reached the first half of the conversation. I'm going to yeah. take questions from the audience, but I don't want Twitter to cut off, um, Instagram to cut us off. So I'm going to take you off and then we'll come back and then we'll take questions from the audience. All right. Thank you. I'm trying to add in. Okay. You're welcome Good. back. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to take questions from the audience now. Okay. It's going to be anonymous, but the questions are there. So one of them says, why are you not pushing for electoral reform and diaspora voting? Why are you not pushing for electoral reforms? And that's the question up there. I, I campaigned more than anybody in the diaspora, so that's not correct. I, I said it that if I was president, the diaspora would be voting the next week after I'm sworn in as president of Nigeria. And I'm still very strongly in support of diaspora voting because if the diaspora were to be voting in this election, we would have come up very strongly in the election because they probably can't rig the diaspora election the same way they rig the local uh, geography here. Do you yeah. think the Nigerian president has the power to make the diaspora vote in a week without the National Assembly? Well, what do you do to the National Assembly? You send a bill to them in a week, you know. If they can get them to pass budgets, you know, if they can get them to pass budgets that allow them to spend for something is that 7 billion naira to repair the National Assembly, that's already you know been repaired too many times uh why can't we do a bill to the to the national assembly to pass the diaspora voting act simple that's what i mean i said i would do it in one week because i work of course with the national assembly okay so this person says what's your position on biafra and do you plan to integrate them back into the this version into your version of nigeria well, I've said it, I, you know, part of the reason I was uh, detained was uh, they claimed that uh, I was planning to
to help forestall or install a Biafran nation on Nigeria because I met uh, Unam Dikani. I am for justice. While I was uh, in detention, I read extensively, especially about the Biafran war. And I can say categorically that the Nigerian nation has been unjust against our Southeastern brothers who are known as Biafrans. And to bring them back, we must give them justice. And justice has economic dimension. It has political dimension. Uh, it has social dimension, cultural dimension. So, but the version of Nigeria that the Biafrans want to come back to is not the Nigeria that calls them 5% and alienates them and discriminate against them. That is not the Biafran that, uh, that's not the Nigeria they want to be part of. They want the Nigeria where they are free to practice their trade, to travel freely uh, without molestation, to practice their religion. That's, that's the Nigeria they want. The Nigeria that doesn't leave them to be killed like chickens whenever there is a small uh, religious or even general crisis in any part of the country. The Nigeria that recognizes that we killed three million of our brothers in a needless war. In Nigeria, that understand that we have to apologize to them for doing that. That's what you do first and foremost. And then you have conversations, and you help build a constitution that allow for a referendum, so that they can have an input in our constitution. I've been saying it categorically. I say it everywhere. The Nigerian constitution is a fraudulent document created by the military. It wasn't the, the Nigerian people that uh, brought about the Nigerian constitution. So all of this must uh, work together. You can't just force people to live together by. Uh, declaring operations after operations of the army, you know, Operation Crocodile Tears, Crocodile Teeth, Operation Shark. They're human beings, you know. You can't so this question them. says, what will you do to the power sector? How will you fix the power sector? I, uh, I said it, and this is why people must take some time, going to have much time to watch some of my videos on YouTube. In the, like, the power sector needs to meet uh, modern requirements, and that is to understand that to get the power sectors right. It must be a combination of sources of uh, power. I'm talking about electricity now. And I was speaking loudly about solar energy, you know, renew the renewable energy that I've identified around the country. You know, every part of Nigeria has one way to generate power. In the north, we can just plant a lot of uh, uh, solar cells to generate power uh, from solar. In the southeast, we can use a little bit of coal. I am not a big fan of coal because it's not clean. But if it's possible that there are technologies that make them cleaner, we can go back to Enugu and do that because I think 10% of even power generated in the U.S. is still from coal. We have huge reserves of gas. There are over 9 billion uh, cubic feet of gas in Ogoni land alone that's sitting down there. We are, uh, we are burning gas every day through, through gas flaring, which is an environmental, uh, environmentally disastrous way of treating gas. who understands technology, we will get the investment we need to develop the power sector and generate power, transmit and distribute power. And the most important thing is not to think that power is such a, you know, a small thing that you allow just individuals to be, uh, to be managing your power sector. It's a very serious business. My government, we have very serious interest in the power sector. We invest in it. We will monitor it. We will integrate where it is necessary, and we will be in charge of regulation so that people are also not uh, taken for granted by the so-called discourse uh, or jenkos, whichever, whichever of the uh, co-conspirators you have in the power sectors today. Okay, so this question says, are you a politician or an activist? Is it right to be both and jump from one to another at will? There's no, uh, There's nothing called a politician. But in the Nigerian palace, a politician is a person who is dishonest, who is a liar, who cannot be trusted. Uh, that is the reason why people use these things uh, haphazardly. Uh, but, you know, Nelson Mandela was an activist and uh, he's known for his activism and he ruled South Africa and left it a better place. Uh, President uh, Obama, who made a lot of impact in the U.S., was not, not only just an, an activist, as a community activist, that's how he started before he went to uh, the State of Assembly in uh, Illinois and then went to the U.S. Senate and eventually became president. There's nothing wrong uh, about uh, being an activist. You know, if you like to call me an activist, I think it fits me better. 
I don't want to be called a politician because I know what it means to be called a politician in Nigeria, and I'm not that person. What's your take on tourism and agriculture in Nigeria? You know, I hate when people just keep going around and they're repeating the same, you know, tired old system of describing tourism and agriculture before you can get people to tour your country. The word tourism comes from tour. You have to have roads now, infrastructure. Before someone can go from here to Bauchi, you have to have security. Because otherwise, Boko Haram will relay you on the road, arm robbers, kidnappers. When you have that, you can't have a tourism industry. We're only deceiving ourselves. Tourism is not NTA adverts. You have to have, it's, it's, it encompasses that you have other things in place, security, power, infrastructure, you know, an economic system that works health. Nobody wants to come to your country during COVID now and be trapped in any country, even countries that are working. So it's, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a whole gamut of things that need to happen before you start talking about tourism. With regards to agriculture, we already, we already have the basis, but what Nigeria is still practicing is subsistence agriculture. What do I mean by subsistence agriculture? It's the agriculture of uh, hoes and the machetes. You know, I, I went to between uh, Taraba and Yola, and I still saw farmers. I even took pictures with them on video when I went to Taraba, who were still plowing with cows, you know. But you have a governor passing the same road with 35 cars. And we have to reduce that culture of driving 35 cars to having 35 uh, tractors. Everywhere. We need tractors. We don't need SUVs to drive up the governors. One governor and one car should be enough. But without campaigning against, because I'm sure somebody is going to jump into it and say, oh, you don't have control over how governors buy cars. No, it's my country. Too. If I'm president, we can campaign against it through leadership. If the president himself is not driving 500 cars, there's no governor who can go and be doing that. We'll campaign against it. And we can make a law that says, look, in this our federation, no governor should be allowed to be abusing public resources by driving that. But some of them even have a, the, I think it was the IG of police who once said that a governor is protected by over 250 something policemen. I think it was an Ambra State governor at that time. They had an issue with the IG that they withdrew some policemen. That's just policemen. You have not added DSS to it. You have not added the different operations in the army that are protecting them. At the end of the day, one governor has over 500 security agents protecting them. And then the people have nobody protecting them. And then you are wondering why there's crime on the street because our policing system is not for the people. And that talks about also uh, tourism. is a policing system that is protecting VIP. So agriculture has to have a modern take to it. You know, agriculture has become so powerful that the technological part of it is so interesting and important. That portion is missing. So our own agricultural system here is still distribution of fertilizers and the propaganda with, oh, we have more rice uh, produced locally than uh, coming into the country. And so we have closed our borders, you know, and you see people believing that you have more rice, but everywhere you go, you still find the same rice. Reason is that they close the border to poor people and allow people who are powerful to be importing rice. How do you know that we are still importing more foreign rice? Just go to Benin Republic and see is, you know, how many of those ships are coming in and where they are going into, which is Nigeria. It's just to boost the smuggling business for, for the powerful and the politically connected. How can Nigerian citizens, the political system as it is right now, how can Nigerian citizens make the best of it in spite of all the different issues around they the system? To, Nigerian citizens have to step out and uh, take control of their destinies. I can't say it's enough. And that is why, after the election last year, going by my experience in the election, I stepped out and called the Nigerians to remove the yoke of oppression and not to be afraid. Step forward and challenge the political authority that is holding the country to ransom. I was arrested. I was brutalized. I was detained for months because of it. They did everything they can to break me. But it's not about me. It's that we have reached a tipping point and people cannot continue under the system of oppression forever. They will one day challenge and ensure that it is reversed. And that's the what absence, I'm calling on people to do. Yeah. In the, in the absence of the revolution that you're calling for, how can we use the local government system and the state assembly 
members who look like most of the time they don't really have much to do. How can how can we use them to make things happen or change? In the absence of that, many of these guys are mentioning that are burdening on our people. You remember that I also had advocated for the abrogation of the Nigerian Senate because the Nigerian Senate had become the coven of thieves. You need the Senate back. to do that. Yes. You know, you don't need the Senate to do that. You need Nigerian people to say they are tired of any system and the system will... So that's uh, a revolution. Then. Well, you know, whatever you want to call it, just call it that, you know. No, I don't miss words, right? But, you know, the reason I'm not using high palutine words is that a lot of people listening to us, they want to understand very in simple English uh, what, what we plan to do, you know. So the system of revolution or the system of oppression that is holding our people to ransom and no longer be sustained. And when the people are tired of it, the people are tired of it. They will force those who are employed or uh, elected or selected in those places uh, to accept that it's time to go home. So somebody says, how can we change the mindset of Nigerians? It seems to be... Education, education, education. You know, you have to educate people, you have to mobilize them, you have to conscientize them. Uh, and don't be afraid. Even when they push back against you, don't, don't worry. If you're doing the right thing, in fact, you know, when Nigerians push back against you, when you have an idea that is alien to them or novel to them, they are saying to you, educate us more. Or sometimes it's because they don't want to move from one place of certainty, you know, of certain suffering to a place of uncertainty. Uh, so they stick there. But when they can trust you, and I have seen this with Nigerians, when they can trust you, they will follow you to the next destination of liberty. Do you think Nigerians are ready for change? Yeah. You know, it's the thing we are lacking is uh, enough change, change agents. Nigerians are tired of this system. This system is not working for them. They are suffering. As we are speaking now, they are in a lockdown. They have no food. They have no social security system. They have no safety net. You know, when you get on, and I'm sure, you know, your DM is uh, completely... Uh, calculated with requests for money and some of it as low as 500 just know that things are really bad you know i'm sure there are people who do it for the sake of just like let me collect from everybody uh because they look at you and say you know all these guys are also collecting from politicians so let us go and collect their own give away from them but people are suffering and you know whomever they can reach out to to get money you see what you haven't dealt with is not the outcome of this lockdown is the amount of you know, uh, firings that we happen, I mean, unemployment that's going to follow this. Already today, I think Eric said 80% of their staff is gone and, uh, and they have placed several others on, uh, on paid leave. Uh, I know of several companies that are going to, that are going to do that. And, you know, some guy, some guy was even suggesting on Twitter that uh, the state government should start uh, thinking about laying off uh, workers, which I think is inhuman. Because what we should tell the state governors to do is to stop stealing and pay workers, you know, and stop the, uh, the burdensome uh, system of public uh, service that is taking more money for one person than it is for 100 people. So, you know, even in some cases, uh, 5,000 people, you know, the system of uh, uh, security votes, which is outright theft of uh, public resources at the state, what the states don't have. So those are the things that we should fight against. And that is what Nigerians should come. This is the right time for political activism. This is it. You know, at a time that, you know, most times that people have had this change we are talking about, it's been because they have been trapped. Uh, but we also need, and I will agree with this, that we need to change a lot of the way our people also undertake suffering. It's a civil system that we have a blood vessel that can take unimaginable amount of uh, suffering. You know, either it is pumped through the vein, through the mouth, the ears, your eyes. We're just there accepting this rubbish. We have to stop that. But it needs a lot of people need the leaders they can trust. They need people they can truly follow. You know, and for too long also, we have been representing leaders that don't truly represent real aspirations. You know, and this is where I come hard on the celebrities. You know, the celebrities are misleading our people, you know, because of the little they are getting from politicians and uh, you know, they create an impression that it's Eduardo. Life, they don't have, they leave it. And then they, you know, push people in different direction. They make them get the impression that they can have wealth that they can never have. 
And a lot of people are misled that way. You know, the celebrity British also need to come to their senses and their consciences. So you said during, when you were ask, ask, answering the question, you said some of those people come to me not just because I collect money from politicians. How do you say things like that without having no, anything no, to I, back I'm, it up? I'm making a general, I'm making a general statement, not you. Uh, okay. When it, comes to, when it comes to you, we'll discuss your matter. And that's not, that, you are not my target today. I'm making okay. a general statement that people actually believe that some of the celebrities or social media influencers are on the, you know, on, on the payroll of uh, powerful people and in going after them to give them giveaways, they believe that that's their only to entitlement. That's, that's the truth. You know, I don't know, you know, I was surprised. And let me be very clear about it today. I was surprised at the, the level of antagonism against you today on Twitter and on social media. The last time I saw you and met you, you were a darling of, uh, of, uh, of Twitterati. What happened? That's a good question. Normally, I should be asking the questions. But I don't think anyone who has been on Twitter for 10 years would be surprised that um, a section of Twitter came against me. That's been no, there honestly, for 10 I, years. I, I, I was surprised because... That's been, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not surprised. I'm, it's it's because something I, that I've no, been... I saw you a few years ago in London. Uh, we yeah. met, uh, I think in Lagos, during social media week that we met. And uh, suddenly, when I came to Twitter this morning, it was all red, and I was like, "That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. It's not, it's not just there. about this morning. I followed you for a while. It's, it's not what you saw was a vignette of a reality. You saw this morning, but over the years, I've had people attack me on Twitter. I have about eight hundred thousand followers on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I have very, very strong opinions. It's, I've, I've done some things that have hurt people's political godfathers. So it's completely understanding. And in the midst of that conversation, people were throwing shots at you too. I don't think those things they said about you were actually true or not true, right? Yeah, when, you, know, like, look, when you are when popular to, to a certain to extent, yeah. when you are popular to a certain extent, and that's why be, be, having, being emotionally mature is very, very important. Because very important. when you are popular to a certain extent, people will throw shots at you. I'm not going to disappear because people are going to be attacking me on Twitter. But I don't want to make this conversation about me because Twitter no, made it about me. But this is about you and your ideas. You said, how did I make up uh, that? Of course, now you can understand why some of those perceptions uh, persist. Because, uh, but that's not, uh, again, between you and me, I have to go and do research. Five months of research on you and come back to another symposium discussion on you. You don't have to do research. I mean, you can just call me. We can have, have a, we can have a conversation. Sure. Maybe if I've been around, I would have known the reason why. We can have a conversation. We can have a conversation because, for instance, um, I, don't, I don't want to discuss personal issues I have with you on, on, a, on a popular, on, a, on an open platform. But I have my reservations. And I think if we want to have that conversation, I think we should have it privately because. I'm not interested in a performance for the public so that people will say, oh, this guy, I threw a shot at Shure. I'm not about that life, right? I'm actually that's genuinely that's interested in having people hear you out. People throw shots at me, you know, they point guns at me all the time. Yeah, you but, know, I, but that's yeah. not my interest. Maybe one day that would be my interest, but that's not my interest. I have no reason to, to play along those lines. All right. Do you have any specific solutions with respect to ending the Boko Haram insurgency? Absolutely. I've said it. First thing I'll do is to fire out the generals. Who are handling the insurgents right now. They are a bunch of incompetent uh, army generals. Now we've seen that with what happened in Chad. Uh, I said it during the election. I'm repeating it again. Uh, and uh, you know, the moment Boko Haram mutated into a business, it's not going to end. It's not going to end anytime soon. Uh, Boko Haram has uh, become a big business, sadly. And until we have a leader who he turns it into an insurgency and fight it as such. And there are blue cool and uh, uh, international resources available to fight and end insurgency. But without credibility, uh, you, cannot, you cannot end it. I will draw your attention to what the president of Chad was saying as they were fighting Boko Haram a few weeks ago. When he had his last meeting uh, of morale boosting with his forces, he said, if you catch them, don't release them to Nigeria because if you release them to Nigeria, they will release them back into the wild and they come back and kill us. That was a major shot at the Nigerian government. Of course, the Nigerian government uh, immediately responded by running into uh, the northeast and uh, starting to fight Boko Haram. But we have not seen the same level of results that you saw with uh, 
chat, you know, and I'm not in any way downplaying the roles of uh, our soldiers who are fighting on the front lines. I understand what it means to be on the front lines uh, as an activist myself, but they deserve better support from the commander in chief. What is missing in all of this is that they don't have a commander in chief of the armed forces. They just have commanders. What's next for you? What? What is next for you? What's the next thing? Uh, in the midst of this, um, I understand there's a restriction for you. You have to be in Abuja. The courts are partially closed. Um, there was a missed date on the 1st of April. What do you see happening to the case and what's next for you? Whether politics or activism or Sahara reporters or some other things you might be interested I'm in. I'm doing what I need to do. You know, I'm, um, you know, I'm very active the way I want to be. I could be more active if I if I didn't have restrictions placed on they place restrictions on me with the hope that they can shut me up and uh, shut me down. And they uh, shut down all the accounts of Sahara reporters and actually kept uh, their goons in front of our office for several weeks. Uh, but uh, what I can tell you is that you, can, you can't shut down a system uh, that is ready to liberate itself. You can't shut down the people who are tired of oppression. You can't. And I can tell you that it's not about me. Uh, and I'm not grandstanding. A lot of people are tired. Even if you take me out today, some several others we emerge and keep fighting on. I'm just very privileged, and I consider myself very lucky that I'm in this place of history today, fighting oppression in my nation uh, in a way that uh, requires a lot of courage. And I'm not alone. I, I don't want to assign or allot all of this to myself. You know, a lot of young people are out there fighting. When I was uh, detained, uh, a lot of people fought and ensured that they kept the battle going, both locally and, and, and internationally, uh, to put pressure on the Nigerian government. And I'm sure that they have not given up. Uh, you've, you've seen a lot of reports on how they tried to go back to court to rearrest me. Even in the last few days, uh, they've uh, started threatening arrest again because of uh, the pot and pan protest that was planned, that has been planned by CORE, the Coalition for revolution that you've seen. So, again, not to forget, and this is not to forget, the reason why we are talking today is how to continue the activism. Even what would you do about ASU? ASU? It, 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 it keeps coming back. That education that. Policy. I have an educational policy that's, that's well explained, because I know very soon we, we have to wrap up within the 30 minutes that uh, 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 Instagram allows. We have it, you know, and that's why I encourage people to go to our party page, you know, aacparty.org, and read our manifesto. It's very clear about what needs to be done. You know, some of it is funding, some of it is dialogue, some of it is technology. I was the first of all the candidates to say it categorically that even the classroom idea should be jettisoned and abandoned because it's going to die. I didn't even know it would last, but that. Two, a year later, you know, classrooms are becoming obsolete. I was the first to say during my campaign, I said in the Niger Delta region, where I come from, that they should stop relying on oil, crude oil, because very soon, even if you want to drink crude oil, you have more than enough to soak yourself in because Nigeria needed to die. As people were making fun of me when I was saying all these things. So let's continue to have this dialogue so that people can start to listen to real political ideas and agenda and manifesto that can make Nigeria a fantastic country. This is the best the old system can offer you. This is the best the failed political leadership in Nigeria can offer you. Put you in a lockdown instead of a lockdown. And then send soldiers to go and shoot you when you are scavenging just to survive with your kids. And then kill more citizens than even Corona has killed. So this is where we are. But we wouldn't have been in this situation, Omojua, if we changed the destiny of this country in 2019. And so, what are we, so in closing now, in closing, yeah. you can address anyone. You can decide to address the Nigerian people directly. You can address the political system in closing. So what's your final word generally? My final word is for people to not be cowed, for people to step out of the shadows and exercise exercise i'm using the word exercise very very strongly their dignity as citizens of this country not to allow the system 
or the operators of the system to bury them with hobbies or fear or you know, assassination or killing or detention. This country has reached a point where we must stand up for ourselves and liberate ourselves. Our country is in bondage. There's no other way to describe it. And we must all step out. And our group, I mean, uh, CORE, has called on people to do a peaceful protest uh, uh, tomorrow, starting from tomorrow from what I learned. And this is for people just peacefully sit down in their houses, their balconies, and beat a pan. It's called uh, Castro uh, in Latin. It's actually emanated from Latin America, you know, so that the leaders who are deaf can hear them even when they are in a lockdown or lockdown, as they call it. And that this should have, you know, continuation until we get our country that we need. Somebody mentioned quickly about electoral reform. You cannot reform the electoral system with this same set of failed, crooked politicians in our National Assembly. If, and I said it at National Assembly during the social media week, in front of all of them, I said, if Nigeria were to be the right place, if we had the right constitution, none of you, in fact, most of you cannot make it to the Senate. Some of you cannot be class captains in this country, including the guy who introduced the social media bill. He could not have become a class captain in my secondary school even though I went to a secondary school in Ondo State. But the system, the electoral system that you're asking for reform, for every, every four, four years they reform the electoral process, but it's in their own favor, except you reform the constitution upon which the electoral system is sitting, except you have a constitution that is made by the people, the same way Nigeria, South Africans made their own constitution after apartheid. You are wasting your time. You can call for electoral reform. They will, they will, they will throw the bait at you. They'll take the bait, and then you have the same electoral system that enables soldiers to go out there and shoot people on election day, carry ballot boxes. You saw it in Kogi State. You saw it in, uh, in Bayesa State. Why are we deceiving ourselves? Why are people calling for reform instead of a revolution of the system? So really, that, would, that was supposed to be the last question, but I don't want this reform versus revolution conversation to, to just go like that. So how does that revolution happen? Is it, is it a revolution as, you know, some of us say we need a revolution or is it a revolution in the literal sense of the word? Which one is literal to you? To basically carry guns and take a system down. Is that what you read? That you have to carry a gun to do I, I, I gave you two contexts. I said, is it a revolution that is about revolution of ideas? You just, said, you just said something hmm. that, that, you know, you have to carry a gun. You don't need to carry a gun to do a revolution. It's not so you're talking about revolution of ideas? Whatever revolution it is that liberates us, that's the revolution I'm talking about. Okay. The one that frees us from these charlatans that are running our country. But the is there a practical way to actualize this revolution? Do you want, do you want to continue? Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining the conversation on behalf of BIE. Um, I'd like to say thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining. I've had a thank great you. one hour with Shogura. Hopefully I get to do this again with someone else. Cheers, guys. Thank you, Shora. Bye.